And we are back. We're here with Nafiz Ahmed. We are on WNRT, World News Radio Today. That's go to worldnewsradio.today. We are also broadcasting on 1040 AM, 92.1 FM, Rochester, Buffalo, New York. Here in upstate New York, we are getting a horrible blizzard here. Um, I, it, the roads are, are treacherous. I, I, barely, I barely made it into the studio today. Uh, it was, uh, people should not be out there driving. It's, it's pretty ridiculous out there. So everybody sit, stay safe and um, don't drive. You don't, you don't need to go out there and drive. You know, stay in, watch some, watch some games, some distractions, and just relax. So, um, But yeah, we're joined here by Nafiz Ahmed. He is an author, investigative journalist, international scholar. He is the executive director of the Institute for Policy Research and Development, an independent think tank focused on the study of violent conflict in the context of global ecological energy and economic crises. He's also a former environmental blogger for The Guardian. Thank you for coming on the show, Naf- Nafiz. It's been a long time Thanks coming. For having me. All right. Uh, we'll start off. Um, you wrote an article um, that uh, was, I guess, controversial from The Guardian's point of view. Uh, you know, it uh, said that Israel is seeking to create a political climate conducive to the exploitation of Gaza's considerable offshore gas reserves. 1.4 trillion cubic feet of natural gas valued at $4 billion. And they were discovered off the coast of Gaza, off the Gaza coast in two, in the year 2000. Uh, you quoted the Israeli defense minister, Moshe Yalon, excuse me for mispronouncing that, uh, to the effect that military efforts to uproot Hamas were in part driven by Israel's determination to prevent Palestinians from developing their own energy resources. Ahmed also cited Anas Antriazan, who argued in the highly respected University of California's Journal of Palestine Studies that this is a part of a wider strategy of separating the Palestinians from their land and natural resources in order to exploit them and, as a consequence, blocking Palestinian economic development. Despite all formal agreements to the contrary, Israel continues to manage all the natural resources nominally under the jurisdiction of the Palestinian Authority from land and water to maritime and hydrocarbon resources. Your piece has received 68,000 social media shares and is by far and away the most popular Guardian article on the Gaza conflict. It was also the last article published by you in The Guardian. So what happened there, Nafis? So I mean, I I was uh, I started writing for the Guardian um, in about March 2013, and um, you know I was commissioned to basically write about the intersection of the environment and geopolitics, um, and specifically my brief was to talk about the geopolitics of um, interconnected environment, economic, and and uh, energy crises. So, you know, for the, over the last year, um, when I was writing for The Guardian, I was, I was writing on a, on a wide range of different issues. Um, but one of the things I, I, I made a point of was uh, looking at big conflicts that might end up turning up in the news um, and kind of uh, exploring the kind of the, the deeper context to those conflicts, the hidden role of, of climate change or the hidden role of energy and resources. Uh, and how these things really are all interconnected and kind of link up. Um, and everything seemed to be going fine until, um, you know, I wrote this piece about Gaza's gas. Um, and, um, I, mean, I mean, literally, I wrote the piece. And I, actually, what's interesting is I, I had actually, um, I'd actually mentioned to my editor over the email um, that I was planning to write this article on, on, on Gaza's gas. Um, and I, just, I asked them, you know, just let me know if there's a problem. I didn't hear back. Um, and that, that was kind of like midday. And the, the article went up on the website at about 7 o'clock. Now, under my contract, I had uh, editorial control over, over, um, over what I put on my blog. 
Um, you know, we had received training and vetting so that they could effectively kind of trust us to have reasonable editorial judgment on what we put up there. Um, and, you know, so we basically self-published straight to the website, which was quite an extraordinary um, privilege. Um, but it was one that, you know, we all tried to exercise, you know, me and the other bloggers tried to exercise, you know, with, you know, the, the, you know, the care that you do as a journalist. Um, and, you know, so I posted it up and then, um, you know, it started going viral straight away. Um, and the, the following day, I got a call from um, an adult, um who basically just said, literally, the, literally in the, the first sentence he said to me in one breath was, you know, this, you know, you're writing too many environment stories. This isn't an environment story, um, and I'm afraid we're going to have to discontinue your blog. Um, you know, and I was, I was completely, I was totally shocked. I was taken aback. I had no idea um, that that was coming. Um, you know, and I did try to kind of push back and, you know, politely and kind of say, you know, do, you know, do we need to have such a drastic response? You know, obviously, I didn't want to lose my contract with the Guardian. I, I wanted to cooperate and work something out. And, you know, as so I said to them, look, I, you know, I had no idea that you thought this was not a legitimate kind of environment story. I've been writing about this stuff, you know, all the time. Um, you know, why don't we have a meeting, sit down and talk about it, you know, talk through the editorial issues and, you know, we can work it out. I'm happy to cooperate. And he was just like, no, you know, we feel that you'll, you, it will be better if you just pitch to us stories that you want, that you're interested in, in, you think that we might like, and, you know, that's how you kind of get an idea of what we'd like to see in the site. And he literally said to me that the problem is, is that the things that you're writing increasingly, um, you know, the, 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 the it shows that your interests are, are not really the kind of thing that we want to see on the environment side. So effectively, I mean, he, he pretty much told me that they didn't like what I was writing anymore. So they were just basically terminate my contract and, and what was of course for me quite upsetting about that whole process was that they didn't actually have the grounds to terminate my contract in that way my contract gave me editorial freedom um obviously within reason you know within 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 the brief that i was you know i was given and that i was commissioned for um so they didn't have any kind of real basis to terminate it and that was what kind of really for me, kind of just illustrated the extent, you know, the kind of the extent of what I, you know, I felt that this was ultimately a, a form of censorship um, in the sense, you know, they, 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 they shouldn't have silenced my blog in that way. But for some reason, I had crossed some kind of invisible line, especially with this particular article, and they felt it was necessary to completely shut me down and just, just get rid of me completely. It, it sounds like there was some there was censorship there, um, and it's. I don't know if you want to speculate, but why do you think that they censored you? Well, you know, I mean, this is a difficult thing. I mean, I think it's obvious that at the time, you know, for some reason, you know, the Gaza issue was considered particularly sensitive for these guys, um, and, and you know, and I've kind of like it's difficult to find. I've, I've not. I don't have any particular evidence of. Um, external influence or pressures as such. But when I did begin to ask around and, you know, and speak in confidence to some of my colleagues and you know, people who've worked in The Guardian, people who are, who have, who are outside The Guardian and are familiar with, you know, they've been in journalism, British journalism for, for years and very familiar with the way The Guardian works. And also um, other kind of like editors and things who have actually got a very good relationship with some of the senior editors in The Guardian and, and write opinion pieces all the time. You know, I spoke to quite a few people, and um, many of them consistently told me that what had happened to me was, although it was quite, um, it, it was quite extreme, um, it wasn't unprecedented, and that they were aware of other cases where criticism of Israel had been shut down, um, you know, pieces had been commissioned um, and then basically kind of withdraw, you know, and then the decisions were made to withdraw the articles before they were published. Um, and, and again, again, largely, largely for ideological reasons because the articles were seen to be too critical of Israel. Um, and in fact, you know, one journalist I spoke to you know, said that this had happened fairly recently. And the name that consistently cropped up 
uh, was Jonathan Friedland, um, who is an executive editor for Opinion at uh, The Guardian, and he controls the fact that the comment is free section. Um, he's responsible for all the kind of the op-eds and things. Um, he didn't didn't have any uh, kind of uh, direct relationship with the environment site. And, you know, the Guardian is a big bureaucracy, so you know I don't know whether or not he played a role in leaning on my editors in any way at all. You know, I mean, he, and he has come on the record and responded, you know, in, in you know in the Twitter sphere and, and said, you know, he didn't have any clue about what had happened and he's got, it's got nothing to do with him. Um, but so, you know, in terms of kind of pinpointing individuals or editors or whatever, you know, it's very difficult. But, you know, the more I looked into it, the more it seemed clear that actually um, this is part of an institutional culture at The Guardian, that there is actually a very pro-Israel, pro-Zionist culture, that editors like Jonathan Friedland um, are part of that and have played a big role in establishing that culture. And it's a culture which has trickled down and um, kind of permeated the whole editorial structure in The Guardian. So it is known, and it's been known for, for decades, that there are certain things which should not really be discussed when it comes to, to Israel. Um, so I think that, I mean, and this is basically what, um, you know, Jonathan Cook, who is a former Middle East correspondent and um, a former editor, uh, foreign, a former foreign, foreign editor for The Guardian, uh, many uh, a couple of years ago, who basically came out in support of me on his blog and actually said that what I had described is very consistent with his own experience of the culture at The Guardian and um, past cases that he has personally witnessed of stories being quashed. And he actually gave some very specific examples of stories that he had uh, been working on, very important investigations of Israeli violence. And there was one story in particular that stood out for me when, when he said that he came back from Jerusalem in 2001, I think it was, um, and um, he had a story, a big story of how um, peaceful, unarmed uh, Arab protesters had been deliberately shot uh, by um, Israeli police, and, um, you know, the Guardian, he, he had thought the Guardian would, you know, be, would be well up for this kind of a story. Um, given his kind of liberal lefty leanings, um, but he said that the whole story was just was quashed, and uh, they didn't want to to run it, even though it was all there and ready to go. So you know that's a, that's like a very very clear example of, um, of 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 what is actually internal censorship, um, and it seems to me that that I kind of that you know I I unknowingly crossed this kind of line, which just resulted in this machinery just going into action and just saying, okay, we just need to get rid of this guy. This guy is just, you know, you know, this guy is saying stuff which we don't want. So we just need to get rid of this guy. But, you know, it might not have been the, the Gaza thing alone. I mean, in the preceding year, you know, I'd covered quite a lot of uh, areas around environmental geopolitics, you know, and, the, and what I was told repeatedly by the editors as, as a reason was that I'm writing too many non-environment stories. So it seems that as, as I, I, it seems that I was um, pecking away at, um, at issues which the Guardian perhaps wasn't used to covering, um, and it was kind of upsetting people a little bit. And I think the Gaza piece was in a way kind of the last straw, which kind of just gave the impetus to say, okay, look, this, this is unacceptable. We need to get rid of this guy. That's that's my speculation. Well, you certainly have interesting ideas on ISIS, which um, you, you've written about. Um, you you think that um, the you know ISIS is more than meets the eye. There's more than meets the eye there with ISIS, and the media isn't isn't covering that. Uh, you've covered that in in your writing. What do you see with ISIS that's you know re residing beneath the surface? Well, I think. So the whole, I mean, what's interesting about the ISIS thing in relation to this issue anyway is that I, I, actually, I wrote about ISIS um, in The Guardian a couple of weeks before the Gaza piece. Um, and what happens is basically everything that we write, we kind of put the headlines up on an internal spreadsheet that the editors can see. So they get to know what we're working on. And uh, one of my editors contacted me and said that they'd like to see the piece before it went up. 
And that was a straight up, you know, geopolitics piece. It was all about looking at the role of oil and gas, um, our oil addiction in fueling the rise of ISIS, um, as well as basically our role in um, through the Gulf states sponsoring some of the extremist terrorist networks that went on to spawn uh, uh, the ISIS network. Um, and you know, my editor wrote back in, in, in the end. My editor wrote back and said, "It's fine, just put it up." Um, so it was. So this is a kind of contradiction, you know, that clearly, you know, there was something somewhere had gone wrong when I when I continued to do what I was doing and wrote the Gaza piece. But to go more in depth into, you know, my my my, my position on ISIS, I mean, a lot of the stuff that I've been doing over the last few years is um, looking at um, the kind, of, kind of the material infrastructure of terrorist networks, specifically Islamist terrorist networks. And um, that's something that um, I think is, is, is a heavily kind of undercovered area generally in both journalism and in, in, in academia and in you know, terrorism studies and all the rest of it. And when you start looking really deeply into you know, who are the, what are the financial networks through which these um, kind of these these groups are able to thrive, and and who are the kind of the states and the regimes which are enabling them and sponsoring them, and what is the relationship of our military intelligence agencies to all of that? And when you look into that, what you find is actually there's a huge amount of very very credible information in the public record from a wide range of sources, whether it's um, you know nuggets of information from the mainstream press, which you have to kind of read between the lines and dig out, or whether it's official documents or congressional hearings or, um, you know, if it leaked information that's come out from WikiLeaks or elsewhere. Once you piece it all together, you find that there has been this consistent thread where over the last decade or so, if not longer than that, actually, you know, the, the U.S. and Britain and some other countries in Western Europe have... Um, with, through their alliances with various regimes in the Middle East and um, Central Asia and North Africa, that they have actually been uh, sponsoring Al-Qaeda-affiliated groups over the last decade. You know, it's, it's not just we were doing this during the Cold War to kick out the Russians from Afghanistan. We continue to do it throughout the post-Cold War period, and, and in many ways it's still happening today. Um, and this is something which is not very well known, but it's very, very well documented. And in relation to, you know, the, the rise of ISIS specifically, we can see that there really is this very direct link between the huge amount of money that was pouring in. By some estimates, it was about a billion dollars of, of military aid that was going through Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, uh, Qatar, uh, a number of other Gulf states going into Syria to sponsor um, kind of the kind of elements of the rebel movement there. Um, but what we now know is that all of that kind of funding was 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 uh, closely coordinated and facilitated uh, by the CIA, by MI6, by various other inter uh, intelligence agencies, and um, that not only that, but the, the CIA own classified assessments of how this funding was being used showed that the vast bulk of it was going to the most virulent, extreme elements of the rebel movement in Syria. Um, you know, which ended up, which that you know that meant the Al Qaeda networks, you know, the ISIS networks, and in fact, you know, we've had ISIS commanders themselves speak, speaking to Western journalists saying that. Western training camps in Jordan, you know, where they were training so-called moderate rebels that had been through a vetting process, went on to join ISIS. Um, you know, and, and then there was this constant stream of, of these people who were being trained, um, you know, supposedly moderate rebels, going on to become um, ardent members of, of, of ISIS. So there are these very, very, very disturbing questions about all of these issues to do with what is a moderate rebel, how well, did we know what moderate rebel is, how do we know what moderate rebel is now. And today, you know, we're fighting this war on ISIS, allegedly, yet we haven't basically taken the serious measures that need to be taken to really undercut, most especially the finances behind the network. 
for example, there is a lot of support and infrastructure in Turkey, a NATO ally, and supposedly part of the coalition which is fighting against ISIS in Iraq and Syria. Yet there has been a whole spate of reporting, especially in the Turkish press, and this is like the mainstream Turkish press, which actually, by the way, is, you know, there is a lot of censorship in Turkey. So the fact that this is coming out is quite significant. That Turkey has deliberately and consciously supported ISIS for a while and continues to actually uh, provide ISIS fighters a kind of a funnel across the border into Syria and, you know, providing all kinds of aid. You know, there's hospitals and safe houses. Uh, near the turkey syria border and you know it's been going on for a while and you know it's happening right under the nose of turkish military intelligence they know exactly what's happening it's it's part of their strategy and yet nothing has been done instead we have you know the united states and britain talking about how we need to basically put sanctions on iran and we need to basically stop the fact that iran is funding terrorism but we have our own ally in nato openly financing isis we're fighting a war on ISIS, and we're basically saying, no, you guys are part of our coalition, and we're not saying anything to them. It just doesn't make any sense. Even if you look at the bombing raids that we're doing, you have literally truckloads of oil tankers going from Syria into, across the border into Turkey. And, you know, these are visible for, for, you know, for miles away. And, you know, we've had some kind of token bombing of oil refineries inside Syria, which is supposed to be like this example of triumphant military operations against ISIS, yet we're not actually bombing these, this, you know, these, these ongoing supply convoys, which are openly transporting oil from Syria, from ISIS-controlled areas, in order to kind of, you know, continue to finance their terrorism. So it really does raise awkward questions. I, I don't basically like to kind of speculate and theorize and come up with grand narratives of what it all means. But what I, what, I can, what, what, I, what I like to do is dig out and focus on, on the facts. But what is really clear is that this is not really a war on ISIS. This is, this is basically a very convenient justification to reinsert ourselves back in the Gulf after basically, you know, we were, basically, we, you know we, we were kind of compelled to pull out under public pressure. And now, you know, we've had the entire national security apparatus mobilized you know, on, on the kind of um, overblown threat of ISIS and the idea that ISIS is, is an imminent threat and is going to basically attack the United States and attack Britain and all the rest of it. And so, therefore, we have to have a permanent presence in Iraq. And I think, in my view, that's what's happening here. This is basically about really reinserting our, ourselves into, into this part of the world where we have very, very um, overarching strategic interests in dominating oil and gas resources. We talk about this on the show all the time. I mean, this is not a conspiracy theory. This is easily accessible information. It's one Google search away. Um, all of this information, so much information regarding this and other issues, are accessible to anyone. More information is accessible to people right now than any ever before in history. Uh, it, you just got You can't just sit there and watch ABC News or NBC News or Fox News or whatever and expect to get the whole picture. You, you just have to get off. You got to get your butt off the couch and and go find it yourself now. But it's it's there and it's there for everyone. Um, and beyond John McCain, you know, meeting with the with Al Baghdadi, the the leader of ISIS. Uh, there's photographic evidence of it. It's, it's really quite, if it wasn't so horrifying, it would be hilarious. Um, but there's some possible circumstantial evidence regarding cooperation between Israel and ISIS just a couple of days ago. And, you know, I'd have to, uh, I'd have to do a Google search right now to find the exact day. But a couple of days ago, Israel bombed the Damascus airport and ISIS bombed another major airport in Syria. I believe it was uh, the airport in Aleppo. Um, so there, there seems to be possible some level of coordination there. They're both going after, they're taking out the, the Syrian infrastructure. I, don't, I mean, it, it, based on the past and the West involvement in ISIS, it, I don't think that's a stretch to, to think that at all. 
Well, I think, you know, with, with all these things, it's about really piecing together, um, you know, piecing together the, the information that's available and seeing if there is a way of making sense of it um, on the basis of evidence. And for me, it, I, I'm always basically emphasized to people that it's really important um, to get as many facts as you can and not to kind of speculate, because speculation is, in a way, the, the downfall of, of, of progressive movements. When we start getting into speculation, we open ourselves up to, to, to counter-argument and critique, critique and, and kind of straw-man arguments. On this issue of, of Israel and Mossad, however, I mean, what you've highlighted is, is literally just the tip of the iceberg. Um, I mean, there was a, apparently there was a UN report out literally just in the last week where um, this uh, kind of coordination between Israel and ISIS was actually flagged up. Um, quite specifically and quite semi-officially. Um, and it kind of goes back. If you go back to um, some of the kind of uh, stuff that's going on, the whole issue of, of, of ISIS receiving this kind of, you know, kind of subliminal support from behind the scenes by Israel has gone on for a very long time. Um, there's been many, many cases where Israel has bombed Syrian targets, um, has, um, you know, which, which help and facilitate ISIS maneuvers. Um, and a number of analysts who have, have, have actually observed that there, that there is a pattern here and that this has gone on for a while. And it goes deeper than that. There's been, there's a lot of, uh, there's been many reports that is, um, Israel has provided military hospitals, that there are Israeli NGOs which are flying into Syria and delivering human, so-called humanitarian aid, which is actually being delivered to uh, extremist elements in the rebel movement, including uh, ISIS. Um, you know, there's also um, been a number of uh, Israeli uh, reports. Um, I'm, I'm in, in particular thinking about the um, Jerusalem-based private intelligence uh, news service called Debka File, um, which you know it's run by a bunch of guys who used to write for The Economist on Middle East issues for something like two decades. Um, and sometimes they put out stuff which is clearly fantastical and very, very pro-Israeli. Um, but what's interesting is that with, you know, within the kind of uh, spectrum of pro-Israeli stuff that comes out, there is some very interesting information that comes out which is actually quite damaging um, yet still manages to filter through. And one of the things that they actually reported was that Israel was um, with, in coordination with the U.S. and Britain um, actually providing aid and support to some of the extremist factions um, in, in the Syrian rebel movement, including uh, Jabhat al-Nusra, which is the al-Qaeda-affiliated group that was the main group that ISIS kind of became an offshoot of, you know, that people were... You know, there were people in Al-Qaeda who fell out with, 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 with what Al-Qaeda was doing over the idea that they need to do things in a slightly more extreme way, you know, and went on to create ISIS and um, join forces with ISIS. So there's been an influx of that. So this is a really, you know, all of, when you put all that data together, um, you know, what we're seeing playing out here takes on you know, a much more kind of, uh, kind of le less the characteristics of a completely haphazard response as opposed to, um, you know, a strategy of, of, of divide and rule and a strategy to really, in a way, accelerate the destabilization of the region. And when we start to realize Israel's role in relation to this strategically, we, be, you know, we start looking back at some of the strategic planning documents and policy papers that have come out of the neoconservatives um, you know, over the last decades in the lead up to 9-11, you know, we really start to get an idea of what this is about, you know, and that, and, that, and that perhaps there are people who are involved in policy and driving policy who have these really fantastical ambitions about, you know, rearranging the Middle East and, you know, Israeli expansionism. Um, and, and to some extent, I think that these are contradictory, you know, interests at play, you know, which, are, which, 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 which is part of the reason why I think the policy is, is, is so bizarre, you know, that I think on the one hand you've got more strategic, kind of uh, more, more, more conservative, national interest-oriented approaches from, from the U.S. military, um, but you've also got, 
you know, this, this, uh, these alliances with, 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 with countries like Israel, which, which are putting all of this kind of, kind of, kind of uh, you know, big, big kind of ambitions to change the region around a lot. And I think these two kinds of ways of doing things have dovetailed into this very, very um, kind, of, kind of worrying and evolving strategy that is only going to basically make things worse in the region. Even from the perspective of the people who are driving it, I don't think it's going to necessarily work in their favor. I think it's going to have more and more unintended consequences that are outside of their control. But unfortunately, it seems that these guys are so hell-bent on doing what they think they, they, they they're doing, they're doing what they think is best, or doing what they think is best for them, that they can't see that you know they can't see that this is really going to just be an absolute disaster for everybody. Yeah. Um, now you've written and talked a lot about and, and covered the 9/11 issue quite extensively. Um, we've had uh, Congressman Walter Jones on the show multiple times. We've talked about the 9-11 issue with him. Um, he, for some reason, was allowed to see, I mean, he requested to see it, and he, and he was allowed to read it, the 28 redacted pages, the 28 classified pages from the 9-11 Commission report. And he was quoted as saying that... If the American people could see what governments, and he said governments plural, or, or states perhaps, maybe whatever it was, it was governments or states, and, and it was a plural, it would change America's foreign policy forever. The, uh, there is much more to meet the eye on the 9-11 issue than the American public in, in the world knows. Um, the, the, the rest of the world is generally skeptical, I feel, of the 9-11 of the story, where Americans gen generally accept the government narrative. W what's your take on the whole 9-11 issue? I think, I mean, I think, I think most Westerners in general are probably just largely kind of, you know, accepting of the official narrative of 9-11. Um, but I think there is also, a, I think there is a significant minority, um, you know, which is which is skeptical. Um, and obviously, you know, if you're familiar with my work, you know that I'm, you know, a skeptic in the sense that I've argued um, very openly that I believe that the official narrative of 9/11 is is completely and fundamentally flawed in almost every single element, whether it's the narrative of the intelligence failure, whether it's the narrative of our foreign policy relationships with Islamists, whether it's the narrative of what actually happened on the day in terms of the response of the national security system and the air defense system and all the rest of it and the procedures that were supposed to be followed that weren't. You know, there's, there's, you know, you, you know in most of those areas, which I consider myself to be having enough of a kind of a, a qualification as, as a social scientist and a journalist to kind of analyze them with some degree of some degree of kind of um, kind of knowledge. I felt that everything just does nothing adds up. Um, and on areas where you know I don't personally feel that I really have the knowledge, um, but even when it comes to issues like what happened, you know, in terms of the you know the collapse of the World Trade Center, you know, I don't know. I don't claim to know exactly what happened. But the official story does not add up, um, and a number of uh, uh, very important analyses have shown that there are very serious problems in the official um, stories that have been put out by by kind of the official inquiries, like like Nice, for example. That there are contradictions in in their in their which have not really been dealt with, and there could be many different explanations for that, but. The fact is, is that they've not been dealt with, and the 9-11 families, uh, many people aren't aware that the 9-11 families who have called for, you know, an investigation, and then, you know, they had the 9-11 Commission, that many of them who were involved in setting up the 9-11 Family Steering Committee, which had, had a kind of an oversight, in a way, on the 9-11 Commission, you know, went on to basically many of the families Certainly not all of them, but many of them did come out and say that they believed that 9-11 commission was completely flawed. They didn't answer significant questions. 
And they didn't just talk about foreign policy and geopolitics and so on. They did also talk about um, issues like what happened with the World Trade Center buildings and, and the way in which they went down. And for them, they were like, you know, this is a, the very least is about fire safety. This is about simple issues like that, structural safety. It doesn't have to be necessarily a theory. Although, you know, I don't see any particular ideological reason why we should not um, kind of suspect the possibility of, of, a, of, of a demolition. For me, that doesn't necessarily prove anything, you know, you know, by itself, you know, there's still a wide range of different possibilities in establishing the kind of the chain of complicity that could be involved in that. Um, but the point is, is that why should we close off our arbitrarily um, areas of inquiry and areas of investigation? In any normal investigation, you know, you, know you, you, you look at all of the evidence. Instead, we found that the evidence was basically, you know, so many efforts were made to kind of demolish the evidence, remove the evidence, you know, even, even with the 9-11 Commission, te- people gave tests. People like Sybil Edmonds, the FBI whistleblower, who had seen um, the intelligence intercepts that showed that there was very, very precise warning of the 9-11 attacks that was received by the intelligence community. They knew that there was going to be an attack um, around the time of 9-11, you know, civilian planes being hijacked, al-Qaeda-affiliated guys, you know, and, and yet nothing was done with these warnings. Um, she's someone who has highlighted our very, very dubious relationships with certain regimes like Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Turkey, you know, some countries that you might not even think should come on the radar, countries like Azerbaijan, where she's described um, documents referring to this ongoing operation called Gladio B, where you know we had... Um, uh, intelligence agencies running al-Qaeda organizations for geopolitical interests in Central Asia in order to destabilize regions and get access to regional and gas resources, destabilize unfriendly governments, and all the rest of it. And she's someone who, who has spoken on the record about this to the extent that she can. Um, she testified to the 9-11 Commission in, you know, behind closed doors. Um, yet though that testimony remains classified. It was never incorporated into the Nine Commission report. So that's kind of the, an example of the, of, of the massive extent of the very real cover-up that has gone on. Um, and people who kind of might think that what I'm saying is, you know, incredible or this is some kind of crazy conspiracy theory, and hasten, I hasten to add, and many people might not like it, but I'm not actually a conspiracy theorist. You know, I don't advocate a conspiracy theory. I just look at facts and try to look at narratives and try and... I, I, I let everybody else do, do the speculation. They can do what they want. For me, basically, I like to stick um, and what we can know. Um, but what I, what, I tell, what I tell people is when you start looking at all of these things and you start to see how overwhelmingly obvious it is that every element of the narrative isn't working... You know, the, you know, someone has to basically start asking serious, serious questions about what is actually going on at these centers of power that our national security has been compromised in, in this way. And my, my first book on 9-11 was actually used by the 9-11 Commission. It was part of a, a collection of 99 books that was um, uh, selected for the 9-11 Commissioners and given to them as part of their inquiry, and my book was a part of that, and it's actually in the National Archives in, in, in D.C. as part of the 9-11 Commission collection. So what I'm saying is not just some outrageous, outlandish theorizing. This is stuff that was actually raised at that level by the 9-11 Commission, but rather than actually doing their due diligence and doing a proper investigation, what's happened instead is, we you know, we... If we're going to take seriously the 9-11 families, you know, we, instead we have a commission riddled with conflicts of interest where people who were doing the investigations had connections to various levels of government and levels of the intelligence community. And some of them even had connections to energy companies like, that were linked directly to suspects that may have been involved in the financing of, of uh, Osama bin Laden and of various Al Qaeda groups. Um, and what, we're, what we're looking at here really is, is is a window into a really entrenched network of corruption, where our relationships with 
these corrupt regimes is very much bound up with um, this kind of ongoing support for, for, t- for dubious terrorist networks. All for, you know, and the people who benefit from this are who, you know, the energy companies, the defense contractors, you know, very, very powerful private interests are the guys that benefit from this. And meanwhile, it's British lives, American lives, European lives, and the lives of people in these countries around the world, whether it's Syria, Iraq, or Pakistan, or Afghanistan, or Palestine, or elsewhere, it's those lives that are basically being taken in the name of, of, of the profits for a few. <coughs> sure. Um, we've had Jim Rickards on the show, and he came on the show to talk about his new book, The Death of Money. And in The Death of Money, he, um, he has a uh, section where he talked about his, his time where he worked at the pe- for the Pentagon. Uh, he wasn't a uh, direct employee. He was a contractor but he was doing economic warfare games uh, for the Pentagon pre-9-11. And he said in the days leading up to 9-11, he saw insider trading having to do with the the airliners, excuse me, on 9-11. He said he also, he knows about uh, one of his friends who um, operates a very large hedge fund uh, said in the days before 9-11, he uh, received a um, a very large uh, bet, a put, against uh, the airlines involved in the 9-11 attacks. Uh, a gentleman from Saudi Arabia called in to, um, to place this, I mean, it's essentially a bet, to place the bet against the, the airlines. So there is none of this. None of this is of what we discuss is being talked about in the media. It's, it's not being talked about. I mean, the American people certainly don't know about it. Um, I, I just don't know um, how this issue is, is going to play out in the future. I mean, will they, will, when we uh, get into a tryst with Saudi Arabia about oil in the future, maybe we don't need them anymore, will they release the 28 pages? Um, you know, I, will this be used for geopolitical purposes? And then, and then once we find out, I mean, how far down, down the rabbit hole could we go from the information we get? I mean, it's, it's this whole maze, like you just said. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I think it's uh, I mean, it's difficult to say, you know, what whether this stuff, you know, what's going to happen on this particular issue. I mean, if you look at the record of past, you know, misdemeanors, you know, whether it's you know it's like JFK or whatever, you know, you get an idea of what generally happens with these things. Is that you know, once you've got the official inquiry and you've got, um, you know, you and that, and that kind of seeps into public consciousness, and you've got the whole media who are, you know, where where you know. Kind of serious investigation, essentially, basically, don't do their jobs. You know that's the problem. You get this situation where it literally just becomes a thing of the past, um, and that's the danger, of course. You know, which is that is that uh, the questions surrounding events like 9/11, you know, accumulate, and then something else happens. You know, we've got 7/7 here in the UK. Questions around that accumulated, but again, you know, now. You know, the, the, the prospects for an independent inquiry were quashed. You know, I remember I was working with some of the 7-7 survivors. Uh, I was advising their lawyers as well, in, you know, in terms of the run-up to the, to, to the legal action to kind of get the gov to force the government to have an inquiry. And um, it just didn't happen, um, even though the grounds for it are, are, are very clear. And, I mean, over here, just to give you an example of how absurd, I mean, you gave some, you know, really solid examples of stuff which shows that, I mean, on, on insider trading on 9-11, by the way, I mean, clearly that's like the tip of the iceberg on, on the stuff that came out in the public record. Um, you know, we had investigators like Michael Rupert who were really kind of at the kind of front line of that line of inquiry. Um, um, but even, you know, whether or not, you know, people who might not like Rupert or whatever, you know, I think he was doing some amazing work. Um, but you know, that, you know, that whole line of inquiry was taken up by some elements of, 
of, of, the, of the mainstream journalist community, and, and there were some really interesting stories put out. Yet, despite all of that information coming out, despite the clear evidence that there was insider trading before 9-11, you know, we had the 9-11 Commission say that, well, that we, you know, the financial trail basically went nowhere. You know, we didn't really find any evidence of anything. And it was absolutely absurd. We had the same kind of thing here. You know, it came out in the public record through intelligence leaks and a whole range of things that the alleged bombers who had blown themselves up on the London uh, underground rail network um, you know, were actually <clears throat> being under surveillance and had been under surveillance for um, at more than a year but at, at least and probably longer uh, by MI5 that they had been identified by name, that they were being investigated as high-value targets. Um, and previously, MI5 had claimed that they had not identified any of, the, of, of, of these guys, that they had no idea who they were, and that they only surfaced to some extent on the periphery of completely different investigations. Um, and this, you know, the whole thing came out of the blue, out of surprise. But, you know, it's, after all of this came out, that actually MI5 did know about these people and knew who they were and was even tracking them as individuals, we had an official inquiry here for, by, by the parliamentary oversight body known as the Intelligence Security Committee, which is supposed to hold the intelligence agencies here to account, and they completely whitewashed it and said, no, you know, there was no evidence that MI5 actually identified these guys, even though it's a matter of record that they did. So it's kind of absurd, and, and it's like, there is, it, is, it is a question as to what do we do, you know, when we have a situation where there is, is information in the public record, it's credible information, it's not conspiracy theories, it's just facts, it's reported by credible sources, um, yet it's officially denied, and then that official denial somehow becomes the truth with capital letters, and if you question it, you're a lunatic. You know, what, you know, how do we respond to that? How do we engage? And I think the only way to engage is to simply keep hammering on um, and to keep finding innovative ways to keep speaking out and to keep making clear that this is credible. Um, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, I, I'm, you know, tr I think that um, <clears throat> it's very important that independent journalism, in whatever form it is, whether it's alternative news sites or whether it's, independent radio like what you guys are doing or whatever it is it needs to be we need more of it we need to be empowered and we need to keep we need to keep trying to mainstream it and mainstream these voices because um as things are getting worse i think there is more of an appetite for answers um and when people start looking for answers and they start getting on google and they start looking there is an opportunity for for, for activists for researchers, for academics, uh, to be in that space and to be there and to be available and, so, so, and, and to put out credible information that people can fact check and people can learn from. Right on, Nafiz. I completely agree. Uh, Nafiz Ahmed, thank you very much for coming on the show today. Um, we're delighted to have you. Uh, looking forward to have you again on in the future if you uh, your busy schedule permits, and uh, where can people best find your work nowadays? Well, I've just, I mean, the first thing I'd really like people to know about is I've just launched a, a crowdfunding initiative uh, to support kind of what I'm talking about. Uh, I mean, I, I'm trying to set up an independent investigative journalism collective which operates in the public interest and specifically works and campaigns for the global commons. And by that, I'm talking about, you know, whether, you know, the fact that the planet Earth and, and, and you know, natural resources and um, water, land, minerals or whatever it is, is a, is a public trust and it's a community trust and everybody should have a stake and have, should, have, should have access and should have, some, have, have a role to play in society and a role to play in determining how we kind of use these resources rather than being monopolized by special interests and, and, and all of these kind of crazy, you know, elites that really don't have any clue what they're doing um, beyond, you know, kind of trying to feed their own power. And, I'm, what, and the whole point of this is that I, I believe that we need to basically create new forms, new, new journalism institutions which are publicly accountable. And that's why I'm thinking that 
if we can set up some kind of initiative which is completely publicly funded um, through a subscription basis of um, a minimum of $1 a month and we have enough subscribers, um, we might be able to do some really, really interesting stuff. And uh, it's been quite exciting. I mean, so far we've managed to raise, you know, we've, we've already hit um, within just two weeks our first milestone, which is about, uh, it, it amounts to $12,000 a year which is a thousand dollars a month, and that's just from people literally just paying as much or as little as they want. Um, we leave it up to up to up to you to decide. Um, and for me, it's kind of like it's great because it's accountability. Because if people don't like what I'm doing, then they can just unsubscribe, and they can tell me, and they can say they can be critical, and they can engage with me, and we can kind of develop journalism in a way which is with people and, and, and has the input of people rather than just being, oh, here we are bringing you the news in capital letters, which is not actually the news. So I'm really, I'm really interested in kind of developing the platform in kind of consultation with our subscribers and kind of helping to, helping to put it in the direction that, 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 uh, that they want it to go um, and kind of crowdsourcing ideas for what they would want a journalism platform like this to be like, um, and I've got some really um, innovative and, and, and very, very cool, fearless journalists in my network that I've come to know over the years who I've spoken to about coming on board if we manage to raise enough of money. So if people can go to the website at Patreon, it's patreon.com slash Nafiz, N-A-F-W-Z, um, you know, you can come out, come and check it out, and you'll get the links to the rest of my work and stuff, and you can kind of just spread the word, really. Well, we're all looking forward to seeing uh, what you can come up with here because you're a real truth teller and you're, and you're trying to get the word out. And uh, we thank you uh, for all of your work here at Black Tower Radio. Uh, if you would hold on the phone for uh, one minute after we get off the air here, uh, I'd like to uh, get a word with you, if that's possible.